background topic that we need to understand is really the understanding of time and so that's where we start today with something of the understanding of time. Now at one level telling the time is simple. Um, you either do it with an analogue watch or a digital watch um, depending on what age group you are. But what I'm meaning is more the philosophy of time that is the philosophy of history. You see history matters to Christianity. It doesn't matter, in the same way at least, but it doesn't matter really to Buddhism or to Hinduism or to animism. What's happened in the past is an irrelevance. The moment, now, that's all that matters. And what happens in the future is an irrelevance. But Christianity, together with other religions such as Judaism and Islam, what has happened in the past is foundational and fundamental to understanding our present because that tells us about what's going to happen in the future. That is, God from the beginning has a plan for the end of which we are part of that plan. We're in the, in the process and it is absolutely fundamental that we understand what has happened in the past. Furthermore, it's important to us, even very important to Christians, that our faith is about things that have happened, not in mind or opinion, but in fact and in history. That is, since the Enlightenment, there's been a great fashion to divide understanding of things as being matters of opinion or matters of fact. And religion then gets dropped into the opinion box. And so that's why we can all disagree with each other, because it's just a matter of opinion. Do you prefer blue? Do you prefer green? Do you prefer red? Well, they're just matters of opinion, which is the nicest colour. But whether the earth is flat or whether it is round, that's a matter of fact. Now, where do you put the religion ideas? For the atheist, you, you dump them all into the opinion. And therefore, that you believe something, well, bully for you. Uh, that you believe in fairies down the bottom of your garden or hobgoblins, well, that's your business. Um, we're not dealing with that, we're dealing with facts. But, you see, Christianity is about history. Christianity is about what happened in the area and realm of fact. Jesus either was born or he wasn't born. He's not just a matter of opinion, he existed. He either did die as Christians teach or he didn't die as Muslims teach. He either did rise from the dead as Christians teach or he didn't rise from the dead as the Jewish community teaches. It's a matter of fact, not opinion, that we're dealing with. And so history matters to us. But how do you move from the first century through to the 21st century where we now exist? Uh, are we locked into being first century people like the Muslims tend to be locked into being seventh century people? Are we like the Amish who try and hold the 16th century and so won't use electricity, won't use cars, won't use, because the way to live is the 16th century? Are we kind of locked into being New Testament people? Manifestly not, we've got microphones and electricity on, but if we jettison things, what do we jettison from the first century? If we retain things, what do we retain for the first century? And on what basis do we say, oh no, that's just a first century thing, not, not really Christian. Oh no, that's, a, that's an essential thing. That has to be retained from the first century to the 21st century. How do you work out which is which? And so we need to begin by understanding the real gulf of Christian history. That is, the real gulf is not 1st and 21st century. The real gulf is BC and AD. For the Christian philosophy of history divides all of time as that which was before Christ and that which is in the year of the Lord. BC standing for before Christ, AD being the Latin, Anno Domini, 
in the year of the Lord. Notice we don't have BC and AC, before Christ and after Christ, because we believe Christ has risen from the dead and is alive. There is no after Christ. There is never a time when Christ is not here, that Christ is not alive and with us, therefore there's no way you can have an after Christ period of time. Everything is either before Christ or in the year of the Lord. Our atheistic secularist friends around about us understand how important this is to an understanding of life, reality, meaning and purpose because they want to get rid of BC and AD and impose their view which is BCE and CE before common era and the common era. There is no such thing as a common era. Uh, what common era? The Hindus do not have this era as a common, the Buddhists don't have this era as a common, the Muslims date the world from the 7th century when Muhammad was around, the Jews date it from Moses' time, many thousand years before Jesus. There is no such thing as a common era. A common era is an imposition of late 20th century atheists and we need to resist it by constantly writing AD whenever you write down the date. Never write 2001, always put AD beside it. Even if there's not a little box on the form, don't worry, just put it beside it. Keep making the point that we live in the year of the Lord. What is important is that we're in the year of the Lord. What is unimportant is the number of times we've been around the sun. But whether you live before the Lord Jesus Christ or whether you live in the age of the Lord Jesus Christ, now that really matters. And that's the real gulf between the Old Testament, full of promise for the future, and the New Testament, about the fulfilment of promise with the implications for the future. But even so, how do we handle the gulf between the first century and the 21st century? Here are three common ways that are done in our community. One, they talk about the great gulf that lies between the two. Life then was almost totally different to life now and so what we have to do is kind of parallel. Find those bits of life then that are just like the bits now and we can apply those directly. But when you find a bit of life then which is really different to life now, well then you've got to look for the essence that's the same and draw the essence across to now. And so the ancient world didn't understand about aeroplanes or radio or television. And so they spoke in myths and legends and now our job in reading the Bible is to demythologize it. So for example, they didn't understand about resurrections and, and so they made up this, this myth of resurrection to explain the continuing presence of Jesus that they felt all around about them. We poor lighted fools think that it's a reality and so we've misunderstood it and on many other things the role of the family in the first century, the disciplining of children, the role of women or the act of homosexuality. There's a whole range of issues of the first century world that, well, they're not the 21st century world and we've got to kind of go back and just tease out the essence that we can bring across. In case you are in any misapprehension, let me assure you that I think those great golf theories are stupid, basically, and completely wrong. But that's one of the ways in which people seek to do it. Another way they do it is by the cessation theories. Certain things happened that were unique. We can't reproduce them, nor should we try to reproduce them. So miracles, uh, apostles, gifts, uh, speaking in tongues, these things happened once in a moment in history for a particular purpose and reason. And we need to read them, we need to understand about them, but we need to leave them back there in history they're not how you live today. And so a lot of the New Testament is historically bound and limited. Another view I don't agree with. The third view is the continuation theory, that everything's just the same from then as to now and in every age. Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. And so whatever we read in the Bible is for today. And we're to put it into practice just as we read it. So we should be looking for peace and prosperity in Israel, either the historical Israel or the church, if you think that's Israel. And we should be looking for, for and using all the gifts, the gifts of speaking in tongues and healings and every other gift that we may think of. And we should expect prosperity now, living under God's kingdom. And we should 
And so we just take whatever is said in the Bible and just bring it across to today because we're living in exactly the same world. I don't agree with that either. Let's look at what the Bible is saying here in Ephesians 4. And think of the connection of the ages. We, we need to find out what it's saying first, though, before we make the jump across to us. Now, the subject of gifts and ministries is exactly the subject upon which the cessationists or the continuationists or the, the gulf theory people will argue. So it's a really good topic to pick up this subject, this whole history idea on. But what's being spoken of here is the gifts of Christ, the ascended king. Verse 7, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Verse 11, he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Firstly, the gifts of Christ were historical gifts. It actually happened in time and space. It, it, it did happen. It happened in the resurrection, after his resurrection and ascension, on the day of Pentecost in particular. There is a uniqueness about them. They were given to us all, but they were unique. For example, the apostles' testimony, the eyewitness testimony of having seen the risen Lord Jesus Christ. But in particular, you'll notice here that they were given to equip the saints. And throughout this series in Ephesians, I've been seeking to show you that the saints refers to the Jewish Christians. I don't mean that they cannot be given to the Gentiles or that they can't be given to the Gentiles in the 21st century or they couldn't be given to the Jews of the 21st century. But the passage is talking about a particular moment in history, the day of Pentecost, when was given the distribution of the gifts of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if not that particular day, at least a particular group, that is the Jewish Christians, as can be seen by their very distinctive purpose. Verse 11, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Long, complex sentence there, isn't it? The saints have a task, have a, a ministry, and these gifts were given to equip them for that task. The ministry of the Jewish Christians was to build the body of Christ. Now, in one sense, this is still happening today, so don't get ahead of me. But their task was the particular building of the body of Christ until we attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Here is the particular desire and plan of God, that all will come under Christ. In particular, Jew and Gentile will be united in Christ Jesus, especially in the body of Christ, that is the church. So look back to chapter 3, verse 10. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. The victory of Christ, the ascended king, is to be seen in the church. And it's seen in the church when Jew and Gentile are united together in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in church. This is the maturity to which the saints had to build the church. So much of what the New Testament is written about, we actually today take for granted. That is, we all believe that in church it should be all one in Christ Jesus. We, we would be horrified to think that there would be a, a Jew-Gentile division within the church. That is, the task of the Jewish Christians was achieved, especially through the Apostle Paul, the Apostle to the Nations. The gifts that were given were to show that salvation is not of the Jews alone, but for the world. It's one of those things that we just take for granted. But if you step yourself back into the first century, it is one of the most extraordinary ideas. For over a thousand years, the Jews had taught themselves and been taught by the word of God that they and they only were the people of God. 
And the only way to become one of the people of God was to become a Jew, was to be circumcised, was to be, accept the reality of the law and place yourself under Moses. And there was no salvation anywhere else. And now these people who have this total particularist, nationalist view of salvation are saying, actually, it's open to everybody, doesn't matter which relation you come from, doesn't matter where you come from, whoever you are. It's almost a denial of 1,200 years of history that they are now taking on. That's a, for a country that's only 200 years old, that's a massive long history that they are giving up overnight. Because when their Jewish Messiah comes, he says, go to the nations. And these people who have been your inveterate enemies and have persecuted you and hated you and tried to exterminate you, they are now your friends. More than friends, they are your brothers and sisters in the Messiah. For us, it's no big deal. They did the task. We've inherited it. And so it's obvious to us. But it was a massive deal. And most of the New Testament is actually written about it. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ first, and this is the second most important subject. We often miss it because it's not our subject, but it's a very important subject, for it spells out the way of salvation for us. Thus the task of the Jewish Christians was to use the gifts that Christ had given them to fulfil his purpose that the church may be mature. Now, Look how the maturity of the church is described in verses 13 and 14. For it says there, Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, in deceitful schemes. Notice, to be fully like Christ, to fulfill Christ's intention, will mean a maturity in understanding. So many people today are trying to put down biblical Christianity by saying it's too cerebral, it's too much in the head. It can be too cerebral if it doesn't flow from the mind into the body and the way you live. If it just becomes an intellectual exercise that you get degrees in divinity, then it's not true gospel. If it's true gospel, it will come from the mind into the way you live. But it will not be the way you live without your mind. It's the renewed mind that gives you the transformed life of Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Now, one of the big differences between adults and children is knowledge and understanding and the stability that flows from knowledge and understanding. Children are very easily fickle and changed in their direction because they don't know enough and don't understand enough. Children are so gullible because they don't know what to believe. They tend to believe whatever the last adult told them or whatever the rest of the group of children around about them is telling them. But the mature Christian knows what or he or she believes. And when newfangled nonsense comes along, the mature Christian looks at it with scepticism and doubt because they've seen it before, again and again and again. See, many people were greatly taken, many Christians were greatly taken with the issues that have uh, come up some uh, few years ago, wasn't it, with the Da Vinci Code. I confess it did nothing for me at all. In fact, to tell you the truth, I haven't read it. I might be the only person left in Sydney, but I didn't bother it. Do you know why I didn't read it? I didn't read it because I read Eric von Daniken. Hands up those who remember Eric von Daniken. There are about six of us in the room. Exactly. If you'd read Eric von Daniken in the 1970s, who produced a series of books called The Chariots of the Gods and things like that, when you saw this new Da Vinci Code come along, you been there before because it was the same kind of conspiracy theory nonsense that was back then and nobody today runs around saying oh I believe in the chariots of the gods uh, you don't meet followers of Eric and Von Daniken now that's, that's gone 
And in 20, 30 years' time, you'll be sitting and someone will come up with a newfangled thing and you'll think, yeah, remember the Da Vinci Code. It's just like that, isn't it? New Christians, baby and childish Christians, are impressed. But the older you get and the more you see and the more you know the Word of God, it's just another passing fashion because the last one has run out of power, so we need another one. Every five years or so, we need another one to kind of break through the impenetrable heart of sin. God wants us to be babies. The Bible tells us that. He wants us to be babies in evil. But he wants us to be adults in understanding. You'll find it in 1 Corinthians 14, 20. And the problem is that Christians are very keen to be adults in evil and babies in understanding when it's actually the opposite we've got to be. Adult in understanding, babes in evil. So that we won't be thrown about, tossed to and fro by the latest charlatan in town, nor rattled by human cunning or by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, what God wants is the kind of maturity that will lead to growth. For the work of Christ and his body does not finish with the saints. It really only starts with them. And the goal is that we will grow into Christ. And this growth happens how? It happens as we speak the truth in love. And as we are nourished by Christ himself, who is the way and the truth and the life. The devil is the father of all lies. Christ is truth. As we speak the truth in love, so Christ nourishes us so that we will grow. Just because it's kind and loving and gentle does not mean you're speaking the truth in love. Rather, speaking the truth in love is speaking whatever is true generously for the other person, for their benefit. Speaking the truth in love will mean not hiding the truth nor sugarcoating the truth, though you might say it gently, but it's concern for the hearer that they might know the truth. Of course, the fundamental truth to speak is the G of Jesus' death and resurrection, of the forgiveness of sins and of regeneration, of God's kindness and mercy and salvation. But it also involves calling upon people to repent. That also is the truth of the gospel. And to rebuke people. See, what do you do when you see your brother or your sister in, in some weakness, frailty or sinfulness? If you do not speak the truth in love, if you do not love, you rejoice. At least I've never done that. You know, whatever mistakes I've made, I'm not that bad. I'm actually kind of like the water polo player. I am pushed up by pushing him down. No, no, if you love, then you go to seek to bear his burden. You seek to restore him in love. You look to yourself knowing that you too could be doing exactly the same thing because you know your own frailty. There but for the grace of God go I. Let me help you, brother. So I'm not going to take my standing on the grounds that I'm better than him. I'm going to take my standing on the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done in and through me. And I'm going to bear his load and burden to help him back. That's how you rebuke in love. And we do this truth-telling in love because God's plan is for ongoing growth which you can see back in Ephesians 4.16, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Notice who is ministering, who is the active agent in this growth. It's Christ, for it is from him the whole body is held together and equipped, but it's also every Christian, for it is as each part is working properly that the body grows and builds itself up. Here we clearly see that we're not talking of any special, unique, historical event. We're talking now about every Christian in church. We're talking about all Christians, each Christian, playing our part that we might build the church. And finally, in this passage, notice how we grow and build. It is in love. Of course, it's interesting, isn't it, that 1 Corinthians 13, the great chapter on love, occurs in the midst of the discussion about gifts. For the reason Christ gives us gifts, and he's given to us all, everyone, some gift, 
The reason he's given each one of us our gift is that we might serve our brother and sister in love and so see the church built in love. Well, then let's return to the question of the Christian ministry today and how it connects to the first century. The gifts of Christ spoken of in verse 11, apostles through to teachers, are the gifts that he gave the original Jewish Christians who were being changed and were changing the world. That's not to say that Christ can't give the same gifts today, but Ephesians 4 is about the original historical outpouring of gifts for the continuation and extension of Christ's plan. Of course Christ may give today pastors and teachers. He may, if he wishes, give apostles and evangelists and prophets, but it's just not what the passage is about. It's not talking about what he's doing through those today. If he chose not to repeat these gifts, that would also be his prerogative. We don't have to conclude that because he then gave apostles that we should be looking for apostles today. Any more than he then gave pastors, therefore we should have pastors today. The original apostles may be the only ones. Paul is our apostle, the church is built upon the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus being the cornerstone. This passage is saying nothing about the continuation of those gifts today. Nothing in the sense either it is or it isn't, it's saying nothing about it. But the purpose of the gift is more important than the arguments of Ephesians here. For the purpose of the gift was to have a united church of Jesus Christ. Not an organisational unity, but the spiritual unity. The church being the gathering, not the institution of a denomination, but the gathering together of Christ's people by his death and resurrection, uniting all people from all tribes and languages and nations into one gathering in heaven, seen in the many gatherings here in this world, united with a common message, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. But that is not finally fulfilled till Christ returns. And in the meantime, now, each part must play its part in the building of the body of Christ in love. Building the body in that spiritual maturity of Christ. Building away from infantile silliness into maturity of understanding and behaviour. And this is not the work of a few alone, this is the work of all. Whoever's a member of Christ is to be an active member of Christ and of his church. And in our activity, we build each other up as we speak the truth in love. This, friends, is not restricted in the slightest to the first century and doesn't require any demythologizing to understand it for the 21st century.